saying there's a whole, a whole group of folks that do this called future visionists that try to sit there and do that using everything that we have today in terms of, of information. We're almost there. Do we need to hit another button? I think they got to switch it to the... Oh, I think maybe Craig's coming running down. It did work yesterday, so we know no, it will work. One thing that uh, I see for the future, we're not going to have projectors anymore. We'll just have glasses, <laughs> or all these slides are projected to, to your mind, and you just you have them automatically. You know, we won't have to deal with this kind of stuff anymore. Yeah. I don't, does anyone watch uh, Black Mirror, the Netflix show? What? OK, if, if you want to be scared about the future, watch Black Mirror, it's on Netflix, and the concept of Black Mirror is that your cell phone, when you look at it, it's black, uh, but it's also a mirror. You can see yourself in it. So it's talking about how technology is really going to cause a lot of corruption and a lot of many scary things. So if you don't want to be scared of the future, watch it. If you want to be intrigued by the future, also buy, you know, watch it. it. It's extremely interesting. Oh, it was a computer issue. I'm sorry. I could have done that. All right. Thank you. All right, round of applause for this guy. Save the day. Right. So again, if you want to watch the, something about the future that's a little bit more frightening, Black Mirror, great show. It's highly acclaimed on Netflix. But let's try to look in the, the next 50 years here in, in terms of peanut butter, peanut butter manufacturing and just Really, maybe even food in general. So we're really going to look at it in terms of five topics. Uh, 50 years now. You've got to bear with me. We're not talking you know, 10 years, 20 years. We're talking 50 years. Uh, personalized health, uh, transparency, big data, where consumers are shopping, sustainability, and gene editing. Those are the five topics we're going to dive into. First being uh, personalized health. Who's done a 23andMe or Ancestry.com, one of those things? A lot of folks, you know, you get that uh, information back and, and you get to know where, where your ancestors are from. How many have, like, a percentage of Neanderthal? Uh, okay. So, uh, who, who, you know, that information is your data or your, your DNA. And it's used currently, it's being sold to drug companies. Uh, you're probably not aware of that, but they're selling it to drug companies to make better drugs. They're using your DNA in that fashion. It's not tied to you directly, but it's tied to your demographics. So if you're clicking that button saying, hey, share my information to my friends and families, you're also sharing it to drug companies. So in the future, 50 years from now, that information will be shared to stuff, uh, folks like us in terms of food companies, and we're going to make personalized food. Personalized food for your DNA, personalized food for your, for your health, personalized food for your diet. And we're kind of already starting to see that some. Uh, you see this Viva down there, they got some that, you know, beverages are for the mind, uh, for detox, to calm you. Uh, we're starting to see food that have CBD oil in it that's, you know, kind of geared for health. But however, 50 years from now, uh, you know, you'll be able to just say, hey, here's my DNA. Can you design a diet for me? Can you design food for me? And then food companies will be tasked to go do something like that. It's, it's quite an interesting, I guess, future. Uh, and, and it's already kind of started happening. On the top uh, corner there, uh, on the left there, that's actually food that was designed based off your DNA that someone, a company started to work on that with an app where you submit your 23andMe DNA to them and they design food for you. Uh, and designed a diet to help you lose weight or, or be more calm or, or things like that. So, However, when I say personalized health, we're, we're talking things even more, more uh, I guess, uh, focused. Uh, personalized health to, in terms of food that might help with cancer treatments, or personalized food to help with, uh, you know, tumors, things like that. You know, diabetes. So uh, it's going to create a challenge for us in terms that that 
we're going to have to be able to handle all this personalized health uh, and and food. And so it's going to create a lot of complexity because you're going to enter your DNA and it's going to spit out and say, hey, you should have Jif peanut butter with this probiotic or prebiotic or with this amino acid added or with this combination of minerals and then we have to go make it. But it, it's slowly becoming something like that just because uh, there's folks really trying to solve that problem today. Uh, transparency, big data. Uh, anyone attended the peanut quality meeting heard me talk about blockchain. Uh, it is happening. Uh, right now, uh, it's been done with lettuce and it's going to happen with other, other uh, uh, foods. For those who don't know what blockchain, it, it's really taking all of the data that we have. You know, the, the growers have information, the shellers have information, uh, shipping companies have all this information, but they're all on separate databases. Blockchain's trying to link those all together and give that information to the consumer uh, in a friendly manner that they can then easily use it to understand where their food's coming from. Now, maybe it's not pinpointing it to the single peanut that's in there, but it's pinpointing it to a region that they could be proud of. Uh, when I say that, uh, Matt uh, Skolton, who, who works uh, with me, just sent me an article this morning saying that 78% of consumers are more likely to buy a food if it provides more information beyond the label itself. So it's providing more information uh, in that fashion. And in terms of big data, machine learning, uh, that's AI. These are things that are, uh, you know, for peanut quality, uh, even uh, peanut butter manufacturing quality. Uh, or is going to become more prevalent. Uh, Jack Davis last year talked about seed, single seed kernel analysis as, as 50 years. That's happening now. Just take that and amplify it. So looking at every single seed to make sure it meets your peanut butter or snack or food specification. If it does, you add it to the product. If it doesn't, it goes somewhere else and, and used for other fortified or functional foods. So big data, there's a lot of data out there, and, and truthfully, a lot of data that, that most companies don't know what to do with. Heck, you, grad students, you get all your, your data in, you don't know what to do with it right away, right? So we're still trying to learn how to leverage every single piece of data that we have to make uh, our plants run efficiently, so we have less downtime, uh, to make our lines run more efficiently, so they, they just keep running and produ keep producing product. Uh, because uh, with the rise of so many brands, and rise of so many different product uh, availability, it's really putting a, a strain on trying to say, hey, we got to be as efficient possible because we're just not going to go out and build another peanut butter, peanut butter plant. We got to make this one run as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Uh, where are consumers shopping? Uh, is, does anyone buy their food off of Amazon? Any kind of snack? Not yet. You will be at some point. Some folks are. You will be probably more often than not in the future because it's, it's a trend that's happening. It, you see it with click and collect, you know, a little bit. The really big barrier that a lot of folks struggle with is fruits and vegetables. You want to go hold your fruit and vegetable before you actually go buy it. But things like peanut butter, you know what brand you want to buy. And of course, it's Jif. So why do you need to go to a store to sit there and, and look at your Jif jar to figure out which one you want to buy? No, you want to buy it off of Amazon. And that's, that's something that's going to become more prevalent. Uh, it's a small portion of our business right now, but it's a growing portion of our business. And the folks like Walmart have noticed this trend and really changed their business. Uh, they were very much brick and mortar, but they're very much acquired Jet and all these online businesses because they realize their, their consumer and their customer are, are changing where they're shopping. Uh, right now, you know, Best Buy, one of the things that they've done great and to survive because, you know, whoever remembers Circuit City and all these other businesses that have gone out is that they took the experience of people going in to buy, to look at their TVs before they went to buy on Amazon and changed it to where they say, hey, if you buy it from us, we'll match the price. You get it today and you don't have to wait a week to get it from Amazon. They changed their model in order to make that work because they realized people were just walking in to look at the TV and to, before they buy it. So where the consumer is going to shop is going to change drastically. You know, we're talking 50 years. We're talking, you know, I'm, instead of having slides project, you're going to have them uploaded to your brains like the Matrix. For those who remember that movie, same thing. You're, you're probably just going to blink and you're going to order your, your Jif peanut butter or your next snack. I mean, think about how what's changed in the last 50 years. Uh, cars now drive themselves with Tesla. I. So who, who says in 50 years you won't be able to, to use some sort of Google Glass and, and 
or just your mind to, to order your food or see your food and have it shipped to you by a drone that, you know, it, yeah, it, it's going to be an amazing, amazing time in, ter in terms of what's going to happen because Amazon's already testing drones for shipping. So for us and, and peanut butter, we've got to take this into consideration, you know, uh, packaging to allow a drone to deliver versus you picking it up with a, your hand. So. Uh, sustainability. Uh, I, I'm sure many of our farmers and all of us have heard of the new Green Deal. And that's being floated around. You know, it's a very uh, aggressive bill or aggressive suggestion. But 50 years from now, those voices that that have been crying, you know, hey, we need to do something, are going to be, you know, they're 20, 25 year olds, they're going to be the 50, 55, you know, 75 year olds, and had all this opportunity to try to shape the world. So sustainability is going to become a much more prevalent uh, factor is today. Uh, you know, more plastic than fish. You know, that's you see that kind of, uh, I guess, material out there, and. What comes with that is just saying, how do we become more efficient with, with how we do things? You know, more, a lot of people complain about Amazon that you have a box within a box within a box nowadays. You get a, a small good, you know, you might order a, a, a gift jar, they put it in a huge box in there, and, and you go, why do I have this much packaging? So you see, see companies like uh, P&G and, and some others trying to create Amazon-friendly or, or, I guess, shipping-friendly boxes, and, and that's something that all food companies are going to have to take a look at because where you're going to buy is going to be vastly different. And then on top of that, uh, process sustainability. You got to be, we, we're striving for zero waste into the landfill. We have uh, initiatives out there and we have uh, goals out there that we release to the public by 2025. Zero waste, lower carbon footprint, lower water usage, all these things. Uh, when you look at those goals and you see where we're at today, they're very daunting. But we're going to have to get there uh, because climate change, albeit it can be sound fictional and sound very strange in you know different ways, it's a real thing for some folks, and it's a real thing on you know that is occurring. I could get into this. I actually have a took a class in environmental sciences. I'm sure a lot of you have have taken classes on it. Well, you know there is there are real things happening to Earth that we have to make some changes to. But you know, 50 years from now. Are we successful in those changes? And we got to make make those things. The other thing is, and this this is kind of interesting, is is where where is food going to actually come from? So Impossible Burger. I know that's a you know quite a frightening thing for for beef farmers and farmers in general. But Impossible Burger is really lab grown meat. It's starting to take off. Burger King introduced it. Uh, I believe there's a few other fast food chains that introduced it. So where food is grown. Might, might be different 50 years from now. Our farmers today might, will have their big acreage, but they're gonna have warehouses on there and have lab scientists and they're gonna grow into Petri dishes? I, you know, trying to look out there, who, who knows? I, honestly, it's a very, very interesting trend and interesting thing to, to follow. Um, so it, it's, yeah, because what comes with that is gene editing. Uh, for those who don't know, you know, GMO got a very bad reputation, uh, but gene editing can't be regulated currently by the USDA or FDA because the genes are coming from directly from the peanut themselves or are found within the species themselves, so you can't really track it. So gene editing, uh, just in general, uh, is, is gonna become 50 years from now like, hey, you, there are scientists out there or uh, doctors out there that are offering the ability as your child is growing in the womb that you could choose the sex of the baby. So who says you can't choose what, what you want out of a peanut more directly or what you want out of other crops more directly? Uh, or uh, you have a uh, genetic disorder and you find it later in life, you can't update your, your DNA and your genes to, to fight that disease because uh, it's every day they learn something new. Uh, there are some unintended consequences that have to be still thought of and learned of, but 50 years from now, science, um, there's a, great, a lot of great work going on here in the Peanut Genome Initiative that, that's got a ton of breakthrough, that 50 years, that, that breakthroughs are past tense. You know, they're just like, oh yeah, I remember back then when we did that. Now we're, you know, 
have peanuts the size of chairs out here and we can use, you know, like it's, it's amazing the type of work that's happening. But it's also frightening because, again, uh, not only are we do, people doing this work on, on peanuts, they're doing it on individuals uh, and, and maybe even creating super soldiers if you're a conspiracy theorist out there you know, in China and all those folks. Um, so with that, I am done. I'm sure I was less than 20 minutes, but that's okay. Thank you. I just want to know if can I still use a spoon to eat my peanut butter in 50 years? Maybe. Um, that's sure to stimulate some questions about where the future of peanut butter is going. So uh, jot those down and be ready uh, for when Chris comes back up with the panel. Um, our next speaker is Donald Chase. Um, Donald is a farmer in Macon County, Georgia. He farms along with his parents, Glenn Lee Ellen, and Ellen Chase, and wife Michelle. Chase Farms produces corn, peanuts, sweet corn, and also operates a poultry farm. Donald is